Hello everyone, this is William Liu of Formosan Presbyterian Church in Los Angeles. Most every day I watch Channel 7 at 6.30. It is um, World News Tonight with David Muir. And I like that particular newscast because at the end of it, oftentimes, they have a segment called America Strong. And this last week there was a one video clip on America Strong. They had a video of a black man and a white man standing next to each other on a street corner, cars going by and they were showing these identical signs. They held up the signs that said, love everyone. What a great message and encouragement for all of us that because we are Christians, we are to love everyone. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse four, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Love is not rude, is not self-seeking. Verse 8, love never fails. Now, in verses 4 to 8, when it says love is patient, that sounds like love is the noun and patient is the adjective. But in the original language, where it says love is patient, the word patient is really a verb. It is a present participle. Love patiently waits, keeps on enduring. Where it says love is kind, kind in English as an adjective, but in the original it's present participle. So it's saying love is acting kindly toward others. Then there's the obvious verbs. Love does not envy, does not boast, is not proud. And then of course verse 8, love never fails. I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 from the Message Bible. Instead of love is patient, it says love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love isn't always me first. Verse 8, love never dies. And of course, the greatest demonstration of love is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins so that we could have a right relationship with God. I hope and pray that we'll be inspired. Love takes action. Love expresses itself. And of course, God expressed His love to us through Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, again, we want to thank you for your great love and sacrifice for us. May we be patient and kind. May the love of Jesus Christ fill our hearts, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I was lost, and I was lost in utter darkness, till you came and rescued me. I am found by all my sin, your love came and set me free, and now my soul
Today's message is God is in the details and our scripture is Matthew 9 verse 35 to chapter 10 verse 8. There was a church sign and this is what it said. The church sign said we care about you and then the next line and further down 
Sundays 10 a.m. only. And of course they meant that they have worship service on Sundays at 10 a.m. And this is one of their models that we care about you. But if you read it very quickly, it sounds like we care about you on Sundays at 10 a.m. only. And of course that's not what they meant because as Christians we want to care all the time. There was a pastor who was visiting New York City for the first time. And of course he went to visit Times Square. And during rush hour, it's um, terribly crowded, hordes of people back to back, and lots of cars during rush hour, people honking, people trying to get from one place to another, everyone in a hurry. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a mother cat comes out of an alley and wants to cross the street, and she's followed by her four little kittens. And she starts walking through the busy intersection. Now, the policeman see the, sees this, the traffic officer runs over there, puts his hand up and stops traffic and makes all the cars stop and lets the mother cat and her kittens cross the street without being run over. The, the pedestrian stopped and other cars stopped and they admired this policeman for taking some personal risk on his own, stopping traffic because he cared about this mother cat and her kittens. And of course, we as Christians want to care about people more than we care about animals. Let's look in our Bibles. Jonah 4, 6. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said, I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? The Bible Knowledge Commentary tells us Jonah was angry, depressed, hot, and faint. He was left to contemplate God's words about his own lack of compassion and God's depth of compassion. Yahweh made his points. God is gracious toward all nations, toward Gentiles as well as Israelites. God is sovereign. God punishes rebellion. And God wants his own people to obey him and to place no limits on his universal love and grace. God spared the sailors when they were about to drown with Jonah in it and they pleaded for mercy. God saved Jonah when he prayed from inside the fish. God saved the people of Nineveh when Jonah preached to them and they repented. God answers the prayers of those who call on him. God is always working and God answers the prayer of those who cry out to him, repent, and he gives us salvation. An application for us is to pray for the people of this world who don't know Jesus. Let's pray for their salvation. Let's pray for all those in authority from the highest level in the White House to all of our policemen. Let's pray for them and for protection and for guidance. As we're going to look in scripture, I want to remind us that the word of God is a living and active sword from the Lord. It is not something dry and lifeless. We may have read this before. Sometimes we speed read through it or skim through it, but we'll miss the details and we'll miss the meaning and the application that God wants us to have. Sometimes the details are even more important than the story of the events themselves. So let's look at Matthew 9:35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, 
The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Matthew 10.1 He called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Verse 7 As you go preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. The Bible background commentary points out that the works of Jesus in Matthew chapters 8 and 9 must become those of his disciples in Matthew 10. Matthew 9.35, Jesus went preaching, teaching, and healing. Matthew 9.37, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And Matthew 10.1, we read already, called the 12 disciples and gave them authority. The Bible background commentary reminds us that the word disciples means students of rabbis or philosophers normally, who normally committed to memory their master's teaching and lived accordingly. So we who are followers of Jesus Christ, we need to memorize the words and the teachings of Jesus and to live according to his teachings. Our first point is that Jesus was moved by compassion. The heart of our Lord was filled with love and concern. When he looked out at these people, he cared for them. He was moved by compassion. Matthew 9.36, he had compassion on them. Matthew 9.36 in the message, when he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. In Exodus 34.6, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. Colossians 3.12 Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. The, New, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia tells us compassion, literally a feeling with and for others, is a fundamental and distinctive quality of the biblical conception of God. And to its prominence, the world owes more than words can express. One, nothing is more prominent in the Old Testament than the ascription of compassion. Because this was the character of God, the prophets declared that compassion was an essential requirement on the part of the members of the community. Two, in Jesus Christ, in whom God was made manifest in the flesh, Compassion was an outstanding feature, and he taught that it ought to be extended, not to friends and neighbors only, but to all without exception, even to enemies. Christianity may be said to be distinctively the religion of compassion. In the New Testament, the word compassion is almost always used of God and of Jesus. There's only one time that it's used of another human being, and that was in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Some people read the parable of the Good Samaritan and think God wants us to be nice and uh, sacrificial and good neighbors to other people. But if you read the parable carefully, you'll see that the Good Samaritan really is Jesus. We don't have enough love inside of us to give, share, and be generous to everyone all the time. Until we are born again, and we're filled with the compassion of Jesus Christ, then we're able to love others the way he did. The main reason for the mission the disciples were sent on is the compassion of Jesus. Mission does not begin with God's anger that some people are sinners. Mission does not begin with human goals. Mission does not come primarily from obedience to the Great Commission. Mission all starts in the compassionate heart of Jesus Christ. Compassion is not shallow. Like the story about a boy who says he is in love with his girlfriend and he writes her a letter trying to express how much she means to him. He writes, For you I would cross the hottest, driest desert. I would swim the deepest ocean 
and brave the wildest storm. I would climb the heights of Mount Everest, such as the depth of my love for you. P.S. I won't be coming over this Saturday because the forecast calls for fresh powder for snow and I will be skiing. Obviously not a very deep kind of love. Compassion in the Bible means to feel in your gut or in your heart. Jesus looks out at the people and he feels for them. He hurts for them. The people were harassed and helpless, literally mangled and miserable. They were desperate. Why? Because they didn't have a shepherd. They were needy because they didn't have good leaders, someone to lead them and guide them. Here in Matthew 9, the people are oppressed, just as some people today are oppressed. But the cure is not more money or a new health care system or better laws. The cure is having the right God, Jesus Christ, the true shepherd. Jesus is like the man on the horse in the following story. One particular bitter, bitterly cold evening in Northern Virginia, many, many years ago, an old man sat by the river. He is waiting for someone to give him a ride across the river because there's no way, no other way around it to cross it. His body becomes numb. His fingers and his toes are, are hurting and his whole body is stiff from the cold north wind. And he's waiting and waiting, it feels like forever. Finally, he hears some horses coming around the bend and he looks at the riders on the horses. He lets the first one pass and he doesn't ask for a ride. Then another horse and rider passes by and another. Finally, the last rider comes and the old man stands up and says, sir, would you mind giving an old man a ride across the other side of the river? There's no other way by foot. The rider stops and says, of course, hop on. And then he realizes that the old man is unable to, to, to jump on the horse. So he dismounts and he literally picks up the man and helps him get on the back of the horse. The horseman takes the old man not only across the river, but to his home a couple of miles away. And as he walks him to the cottage, the horseman says, I noticed you let several other riders pass by without getting up and, and trying to ask for a ride for them. Then when I came up, you immediately asked me for a ride. I'm curious on why on such a, a terribly cold winter night that you would wait and ask the last rider. What if I refused and left you there? The old man looked the rider in the eyes and said, I've been around these parts for a long time. I reckon I know people pretty good. I looked into the eyes of the other riders and I immediately saw there's no concern for my situation. It would have been useless to ask them for a ride. But when I looked into your eyes, kindness and compassion were evident. I knew that you would help me. The, the rider on the horse said, thank you. And he said, may I never get too busy in my own affairs that I fail to respond to the needs of others with kindness and compassion. And with that, Thomas Jefferson got back on his horse, turned around and made his way to the White House. When we look at people, are our hearts moved by compassion? Do we have concern for other people like Jesus had concern and compassion for others. Our second point is that Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. The harvest belongs to him. He is Lord of all. We read Matthew 9, 37, 38. 38, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. 2 Corinthians 6, 1, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Colossians 4.11 These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. The word fellow workers in the original language is a compound word of two words. Soon ergos, literally co-workers. 
What a privilege and honor it is to be a co-worker with Jesus Christ and to serve him in his kingdom. What is needed? Laborers, workers, people who are willing to work for Jesus Christ in his kingdom. Jesus did not ask for volunteers. He said, the laborers are few, therefore ask the Lord. Because the need is so great, pray for God to do something about it. The point is that we don't make ourselves witnesses or missionaries or co-workers. We are to pray and ask God to do it. It is not our mission, it is God's mission. The world and the harvest in it belongs to Jesus. He is the Lord of the harvest. There's more detail in these verses. When Jesus speaks of laborers or workers, the word worker is a very humble word. Jesus doesn't say we should pray to God to send heroes or all-stars or experts, innovators or geniuses, people who have the highest education. Jesus wants everyday people. These workers are not to sow, but they're to reap. They don't have to invent. They are to finish the work that God started. Workers simply need to be willing to do what needs to be done. And this is what Jesus says to pray. Pray for workers that God will send out, literally push out to make disciples of Jesus. Another small detail that we could easily miss. Jesus, the verse, the Bible says in Matthew 10, these are the names of the 12 apostles. Everywhere else in Matthew, the 12 are called disciples. But here in this only occurrence, they are called apostles. The word apostles means those who are sent. The emphasis is on God sending and giving authority on these 12. The word apostles is a functional term. It describes their function or their mission, not their status or who they are. So to apply that to us, the church is apostolic, not because of pastors who are linked to the apostles. The church is apostolic because we also are sent. We are part of the Lord's ongoing mission to the lost world. The 12 apostles here were not the most educated people. Many of them were fishermen. Matthew calls himself the tax collector. He used to steal from people by inflating their taxes. And it reminds us of God's amazing grace and that God can save anyone and God can use anyone. The late great German-American architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe is known for his exhaustively planned, incredibly detailed plans for buildings. In his skyscrapers, every aspect of the interior and the exterior is coordinated into a single ideal. Nothing essential is omitted. Nothing that is included is out of place. The famous statement, God is in the details, is attributed to Mies van der Rohe. God is in the details, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. The perfection of the whole depends on the perfection of the details. The meaning of the whole is inseparable from each of the smallest details. His statement also applies when we read the Bible. If we are careful to look at the details, it is a way of seeing the Word of God, the Logos, the truth, the message of God in the individual words. Slowing down to read the details forces us to attend or give fully give our attention to the verses so that it becomes more real to us. It becomes the Word of God in us. 
the compassion of Jesus Christ, the great need of the harvest, the direction for us to pray for laborers, pray that God will send workers into his harvest. God calling ordinary people to be his co-workers. The ongoing mission of Jesus Christ, his compassion for all the people in the world. God is in the details. I want to read to you the words from this Presbyterian hymn called, Here I Am, Lord. The first verse says, I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in deepest sin, my hand will save. Verse 3, I, the Lord of snow and rain, I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turn away. Verse 4, I will break their hearts of stone, give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for such a wonderful passage of scripture and the example of Jesus Christ, how he loved people. Lord, we pray that you would give us the love and compassion of Jesus Christ, that the love of God would move our hearts and move us into action. Help us to know how to pray. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would accomplish your word and do your work in our world today. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.